thank you for coming in. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to show up for this because this really is the crossroads of the medium term future, right? Augmented reality is a hot term right now. Blockchain is obviously a hot term right now. Probably the only other term that's hotter in Silicon Valley is AI, and I'm glad that I'm following Bill because it, um, it's good timing. It's almost like the programmers were trying to encourage poking the bear because I, I do have some caveats and some warnings about AI issues. My, uh, my sub header of my talk was an agency primer. Agency in quotes there, not because I run a creative agency, but agency talking about your own agency on the web. So if you don't mind, before I launch into who I am, it would be great to know who is in the room. If you have a mobile browser, go to Slido, sli.do on, a, on, a, on your browser, enter the code ARBC, which is augmented reality blockchain. It's a one question poll, just basically saying, what do you guys do for a living? Do you work in either one of these spaces? I'm assuming most people at AWE work in some sort of extended reality realm. Some of you might work in blockchain. I'm hoping one, two of you work in the crossroads of the two. OK, this is a little bit about me. So I run a studio, a creative studio called Heavy. We do really large format public art installations all around the world. It has nothing to do with blockchain. <laughs> so I'm not here pitching my company. I'm not here pitching my services in regards to this. I'm also the interim chair for the OpenAR Cloud of their blockchain working group. Now, OpenAR Cloud's a relatively new initiative, uh, industry group. I'm, I'm the chair of working group 11, which is the newest working group of that new group. So the, the number of people that are hopefully more than familiar with this space is very limited. And I'm here to really try to elicit as much support as possible from anybody who's interested in this space. So I, I do these two things. Heavy is my day job. Open AR Cloud stuff's a volunteer basis. And you'll see some of the other talks around here from Open AR Cloud groups. Back in 2015, I was cohort number four for Blockchain University, which is essentially a blockchain accelerator here in Mountain View. It was at that time almost exclusively Bitcoin based. E Ethereum was just emerging onto the scene. But we did a deep dive into how to code on, on blockchain, how to build business cases around it. So I've been paying attention to blockchain stuff for about four years, which is on average, longer than most, considering that Bitcoin only came out in 2009. Out of that university or blockchain university program, the, the head of the Accenture blockchain uh, venture fund and I started a group called Monarch. And we, we were trying to create a payment rail system for ad blockers, privacy trackers, essentially saying, Let's, let's try to monetize these best-in-class services, ad blockers, et cetera, that are typically free downloads. Let's try to help them monetize so that they can improve and fight the war against ads on our behalf. And that was all based on uh, Bitcoin and Lightning Network explicitly. Down in the corner, I put it in very small print. That's just a little bit about me. I am unabashedly, I wear my politics on my sleeve. So 90% liberal, 10% libertarian. I have a law degree from Georgetown. I had a law practice in LA for about 10 years. Now I just do tech. I also studied economics at UCLA. So I sit in this relatively unique seat of being able to evaluate both AR and blockchain. And it's because of that that I kind of got tasked with Open AR Cloud to interim, that, interim chair that group because very few people would. All right, so I'm told that in um, in these environments, I'm not giving you guys investment advice, right? This is not me saying, hey, invest in these blockchain companies or invest in these AR companies. Now, I was supposed to have a live web connection here to a slider results. We don't have that, so I'm just going to have to do it the old fashioned way. The results for this crowd say that 40% of you work in AR exclusively, 0% work in blockchain, 25% work in both, oddly enough. Anybody want to feel comfortable raising their hand if you work in both? One, two, awesome. Excellent. Great. So we have some people in the crowd. That's a little bit uh, unfortunate for me because now I can't just make it up. Some people are going to be able to call, up, call me on it. Um, so sorry I can't show the results, but 35% um, of you work in neither one of these spaces. But I'm glad you guys are taking an interest. So before I launch into a description of, of, of the current environment, I thought maybe it'd be useful just to give you a scenario, right? Uh, a use case. So 
if you don't mind, I'm just going to read that real quick while I'm walking through the pictures. So imagine, near-term future, you're a computer science student at MIT. You get up early, your first class is quantum computing. Right? You're walking to class, listening to your tunes. You're running through your lessons in your mind from last week on qubits and hypervacuum chips, and you're going to be basically programming the hardware of the future. Because you take your class notes on Google Docs or some other connected service, that service and that AI agent can read where you are in the lesson plan, knows what you're up to, knows what your interests are, knows how well you're doing in class. You're no longer using Chrome, by the way. You're using a browser called the Brave browser, which has built-in JavaScript controls and privacy blockers or privacy protectors. But tied with that browser is a, an ability for you as an individual user to prevent ads you don't want to see, permit ones that you do. So in a sense, you're creating your own ad network, your own ad marketplace for your attention span. And you can broadcast that out to the network. And your AI agent has been doing that for you since before you got up. It knows that you're walking your way to class. Let's see. So that's your class. That's your private price index through the Brave browser. And your agent says, OK, I found this ad from Intel for the latest chip. And it, Intel's willing to pay your price, right? Your price is equivalently <laughs> for watching a 40-second ad and maybe answering a couple questions, because by the way, it actually helps you study for your upcoming class. It essentially pays you enough to cover the costs of your latte and breakfast sandwich, which is in between your class and your home. Right, so this is a little scenario. This is all happening in the background, mostly on your behalf, with a little bit of yes, no on your input. Now, we also don't have streaming here. So this is a video. I can just give you the synopsis of it. It was only a 30-second clip or so. Right? If you look at the date up there, 2013, this is a video, and I'm, I, I apologize, I have to read it about it, but it's a video about the Argus platform, right? which is a drone platform that 1.8 gigapixels of CCD footage per second is generated and monitored by the AI system simultaneously, where it can monitor every single moving object on the ground from 18,000 feet within a 15 square mile radius, simultaneously. Right? That was 2013. That was the state of the art in AI systems then. And Silicon Valley's sort of modus operandi is, you know, we break things fast and we'll apologize for it later. Look at Facebook. 2014, Google acquires DeepMind. 2015, 2016, they're about DeepMind's granted admin access to Google's data farms, presumably for energy usage, et cetera. But you know, it really only takes a small patch update for DeepMind to get access to all of Google's data centers. So that's, a, that's, that's sort of the, the scenario where we're thinking, how do we deal with that? Right? And I'm not here to talk about the future of AI. That's, there, there are some smarter people in this conference that can talk about it than me. I'm here to talk about how blockchain can help us in that scenario. So Bitcoin is the OG, right? It's the first one. It's about $150 billion market cap right now, $8,500 per token, give or take, on the market. It's used almost exclusively for financial peer-to-peer -peer transfers, right? So transfer of financial value between two people permanently. It has very little function outside of that, reason being, the coding language it was coded in, script, has a lot of functionality limits. You can't do loops. It's not Turing complete. It's actually really purposefully built for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And there is a, an update scheme called a BIP, or Bitcoin Improvement Protocol. So you can expand upon some of the underlying functions of Bitcoin, but you can't really expand it that far. And on top of that, how Bitcoin expands it, or how the, t the team that is coding Bitcoin expands the functionality is also problematic because you've got a group of developers that have to agree on what goes in the code base. You've got a group of miners that have to agree on whether or not they're going to adopt the code. And those miners, by the way, more than 50% of them are in China right now. So mining for Bitcoin is also now becoming a strategic concern. Whether or not we can actually plan on Bitcoin being the long-term blockchain solution that we want to build on, you know, there's, there's open questions. Ethereum was built to answer a number of them. It also has its own limits. 
But it's essentially a world computer, a distributed computer, where you can write code and have it sent out to the servers around the world, and that code's going to run autonomously for you. It's not something that somebody can censor, that somebody can take down off the network. It's not something like Visa, where there's a centralized node of control over the transactions. Unlike Bitcoin, where Bitcoin has 21 million tokens, and each one of those 21 million tokens has eight decimal points of fractional value behind it, so 100 million 100 millionths of a, of a token. Each one of those 100 millionths, they're called Satoshis, each one of those is identical. Basically represents a store value on the Bitcoin network. With Ethereum, however, you can have tokens that are completely individually unique and non-fungible. They're not like any other token on the network. So that, that provides some really interesting use cases, especially in an AR 3D world. And because this is a smart contract computer, we have something called dApps, which are distributed apps. And essentially, Ethereum as a network acts like Apple's App Store, where instead of downloading apps to your phone, you can download dApps to your wallet. So it provides a lot more functionality, extensibility. These dApps are distributed across the network. They run automatically. You don't have to intervene with them. Basically, if you send a transaction to the contract, if you send some financial value in, in Ether to, the, to this contract, that contract will perform its code. It does, however, require a, a, a wallet of some kind that you're going to work off of, like, a, like status is one that we build on um, with, at the Ethereum hackathon in Denver. There's a bunch of hackathons that are actually really well established at this point now. So dApps are kind of the future of the Ethereum network. Now, everybody that's in AR specifically, most people probably in this room have seen Keiichi Matsuda's stuff, right? Kind of Black Mirror-esque, but basically, it's a vision of the near-term future where AR has completely overwhelmed your environment. Now, I don't think anybody in this room wants to build that, and I think his videos are a great warning against that. But even a third of that stuff, if it's on a distributed network, if it's pushed in, in front of you, whether it's mobile or heads up, just even a third of that stuff is just mind-boggling to think about actually interacting with on a conscious level, like saying yes, no, is there a certain level, and God forbid that there's a transaction behind something and you have to approve it on a credit card charge. So this is something that obviously we don't want to build, but just by nature of having dApps that are distributed across the planet, you could have a million autonomous apps, some of which are, are governed and run by human agents, some of which are going to be run and governed by, by bots, potentially even coded initially by bots. Okay, so that's a little bit of a, the landscape. Now, this, this is where I start getting into what's currently at play. And there's not a lot at play. This company I'm interested in, it's called Block B. They're out of London and I forget which other country they're, they're headquartered out of, but they launched their token in 2017. Now, the way that they describe it in their white paper, which, by the way, if you guys are going to get into blockchain stuff, for sure, read the white papers. Don't just read the website hype. But the way they describe it in their white paper is an interactive UI layer for smart contracts. Now, Bill, right before me, was talking about how AR potentially could be an interface layer for AI. But if we're talking about smart contracts or blockchain code snippets or even just normal blockchain transactions, how are you going to visually interact with them? Is it going to be something that you do on a wallet? Is it going to be something that's heads up? So they're creating. And a UI system, a UI layer, specifically for blockchain elements. And this is going to be visualized or rendered in a web browser, a mobile browser. You can do 3D objects, you can do media snippets, whatever you want, just like you can with any other AR app. So one of their examples that they use is ticketing, right? Eventbrite. You probably have an Eventbrite app in your, in your phone that holds the barcodes for every event you're going to attend through it that, that's hosted by Eventbrite. Now, what if that ticket, however, was something that was cryptographically secure, something on the blockchain, and that, chick, and that ticket was now, because it's already on your phone, that ticket is an entry point into your interests and your lifestyle. So that ticket can evolve over time. It's not just a barcode anymore. So if you associate media elements with it, um, you could have a music player embedded in the ticket where the artist would push out songs right before his 
event right before his concert that you're going to that you have the ticket for to get you pumped for the concert. You could have a drink ticket attached to it where it's only redeemable at that venue on that day. So all of these things can be geofenced, they can be time locked. It also can become a, an entry point for audience members to interact with for social, social connections. So you, you look at what their market cap is, $11.9 million right now, it's not a ton of money. But you know, I, I think a well-funded venture company could probably buy most of the tokens on that. But they've been around from, since 2017, their white paper saw that the team is exceptional. I'm, I'm definitely keeping an eye on these guys. I'm hoping that we'll be able to pull them into the open AR cloud because they are running distributed open source code. Their goal is not to create a siloed economy. Their goal is to actually enhance the blockchain um, systems that are out there. It runs both on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and EOS. And they're building bridges um, across other tokens as well. So this is probably, I, I lead with this company because I like what they're doing and they're probably the most explicitly in this exact crossroads of, of AR and blockchain. So it's blockv.io if you want to look them up. I was at a, um, a best in branded content panel earlier over in one of the other uh, rooms and, and one of the panelists said, I think it's highly important that everybody strategically think about the world not as a series of geo, uh, of geo points, physical spaces, but also as the fact that we're gonna have a very soon a digital double of the entire world created, spatially 3D digital. Now, I call this a land grab because there are companies that are trying to tokenize that digital double, right? Trying to say, I wanna claim exclusive control or ownership over this digital point on the planet in order to connect it with other contracts, in order to serve ads on that space, in order to then potentially even further sell that digital real estate. There's a small list, that's the bit.ly link up there. There's a small list that our working group has going on right now. So if you wanna check that out, you can see some of the other companies that are in the space. These are probably the four most prominent. I, again, if, if you guys are in this space of working on both blockchain and AR, please help contribute to the world of what we're trying to build here. But versus, um, they're doing enterprise, oriented sort of contract management associating like if you've got a warehouse and you've got some inventory whether or not there are some inventory controls built into those objects so that if you can have inventory turnover or guaranteed that nothing's going to stay on the shelf too long so there's a lot of rules based um, contracts that they're putting in place that are again geo coordinated and I also have to say so um, Steve Swanson is their biz dev guy he's also on this working group with me and uh, he contributed a lot to some of the content here so thank you, Steve, if you're anywhere in the, on the premise. Bubble.io, again, similar idea. Um, Geo-coordinated ownership of specific points in real space that you can then display AR ads on top of. I tried to read their white paper, but it uh, looks like they didn't pay their Google bill because the website's live, but the, web, the white paper cannot be downloaded. Um, high Fidelity and Decentraland. These are, if you're familiar with Ready Player One, they're kind of trying to build a decentralized version of the Oasis, so not controlled by one company, but decentralized. And then these are some of the organizations in the space. Decentralized Identity Foundation. Now, I didn't get to cover identity. Identity is a massive point when it comes to blockchain. It's also a massive point in that world that Keiichi, Keiichi is trying to prevent. Identity is a massive point of both failure, but also, um, I, th I think hope, they're, they're doing a ton of great work at DIF. VR Blockchain Alliance, they're trying to actually connect more virtual goods in the VR world, kind of Oasis again. And then OpenAR Cloud. So it's a small crossroads, it's emerging. I'm glad to see that you guys are interested in that kind of future, because obviously you're <laughs> sitting here listening to me babble on about it, but I, I promise you if you find me out by the pool and we're having a beer, I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff at great length. So that's it. Anybody? <laughs> Hard to come up with questions in this space because it's like, you know, the future worlds colliding. Yeah? Do you see a time in the very near future where much like mineral rights under the ground, like if you buy a piece of land you may not own the mineral rights, that you'll have a time where you might own a piece of property but not own the digital rights to that property? 
Yeah, the question is, do I see a time where there might be digital air rights or other digital rights that sit on top of a piece of real property that you don't have access to? Um, I've actually, I, I've written an article about this exact topic because one of my previous AR startups is we were trying to create um, an AR overlay on top of billboards and whether or not the billboard companies could prevent us because they own the underlying content. And when it comes to real property, which, or real property law, um, you're not excluding anybody by putting digital stuff on top, right? You're not, and that's typically what real property rights are, revolve around, is whether or not you have the right to exclude entry or exclude people from using something. So it's kind of like the internet, where you can have a million pages deep on a, on a, uh, on a given domain. You're just adding stuff, you're not taking anything away. So I can't see anybody buying a piece of property that already has all exclusive digital rights sold off somewhere else. Right? With mineral rights, you can do exclusive activities. You can say only one company can come access the property or drill under, but with, not with digital. So I can't see it. It's not to say people won't try. <laughs> It's totally murky, and I, the courts haven't weighed through any of these questions yet. So again, the fact that you're not creating damage to the underlying real-world property, unless it's something disparaging that might be you know, libelous or what have you, um, it's hard to see how, if you're not damaging something, uh, then the courts wouldn't try to stop you. I mean, I, I, there is one case that I can think of, right? There was a Spider-Man movie set in New York City where Sony, the maker of the Spider-Man movie, recreated Times Square digitally, but they put all new ads on all the billboards. And so the Times Square group tried to sue Sony, saying, hey, you're taking over our property rights with our ads. They lost that case. So Sony won. So Sony was able to recreate that space digitally, do it in their own way, and the court said that's a First Amendment right. So there's, that's, there's one case on, on point. Anybody else? Yo. Um, so you referenced the identity as being a tipping point for blockchain on the CEO of a former blockchain company, so I would agree with you. Do you think that the security company will either take this or will leapfrog in the third world maybe where they'll have bigger IDs for identity like the CNN? I mean, have you seen any innovation in that space? It's an area I'm following closely. I'm curious. Like coming out of Africa or other? Yeah. I, I have to tell you, I, I feel vastly underprepared to talk about identity. <laughs> I, it's such a deep topic, and there, and, and it's, there are governmental issues, there are, it, it's, I don't know, so no, in a, short answer is I've not seen anything coming out of third world countries where you might be surprised otherwise because they potentially are leapfrogging the existing systems. Um, I, I hope they come up with an interesting solution, but no, I, I really do feel like it's sort of the cutting edge spaces that are really driving the space. Cut, like the DIF, et cetera. So, sorry I can't be more in, encouraging on that front. Uh, okay, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I think I've got 30 seconds left of my 30 minutes, so well done for sticking with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs>